Okay, let's, let's, let's pray. Lord, we, we love you, and, and we have absolutely no idea what our lives would even mean if it weren't for you. I, I don't know what the point of this would be, but we thank you that you really are alive and that you're doing things to help your people and to spread your gospel, because, boy, we need your help. Now, I pray that you would speak to us, that you would move us by your spirit and encourage us to believe you for more. In your name, amen. I want to begin with a story. Um, my good buddy, Klaus Isler, who was my professorial colleague at Talbot for, I guess, 25 years. He's retired now. Um, he taught a doctoral uh, seminar uh, every semester, and one of the things that he would do in this seminar would be to begin class by asking if anybody had a prayer request that they would like to bring before the Lord, and if somebody had one, they would bring them and sit them in a chair in the middle, and they would all, the other students, there were like 8 to 10, 12 students in the class, they would surround him and lay, and lay hands on him. If they couldn't get to him, they'd just direct their hand toward him. And uh, someone would pray sp specifically over this situation. Well, one day, this uh, grad student in the class named Jason, uh, who, uh, he was a married guy, and he uh, had left his job with his wife because he really felt prompted by the Lord and had a deep passion to become a pastor and get a, get a seminary training. And so he, he did, although now he was in a doctoral program in, in education. And he said that, he told the class, our, our tuition money is due in two weeks and we, we don't have the money. And I've, I, I have, I've talked to my parents and they just can't help. My wife's parents can't help us. And I'm going to have to drop out of school because I'm not going to take any more of loans. I can't do that. And I, 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 I want to pray for a specific amount because I, I just need God's reassurance that, that he really wants me to be here. Or maybe I've misunderstood his direction. And what I need is $2,117.60. And that's, that's my tuition bill. And I'm, I would like the class to pray for that. So Klaus said, we'll do it. Everybody did this, and, and he prayed over this student, Jason. Lord, you know the situation. And our brother here needs uh, his tuition bill, $2,117.60 plus. If you would grant him that specific amount, it would, it would it so boost him and his wife's willingness to stay in there and finish their program because they've had some rough times. And they're kind of wanting to throw in the towel, Lord. So they prayed for that. Next Monday, class convened, and they were kind of excited to hear what happened. And the answer was nothing. There was no, no funding. And he had, uh, and I think it was until the, the next, either that Friday or the next Monday, that uh, they had another week. And so they said, well, let's pray again. And they did. Now, unknown to his class, and actually uh, unknown to uh, Jason and his wife, Heather, uh, at the beginning of his prayer request, Heather's great-grandmother was uh, fading, and she was going to move into a, a facility from her home. And so she had asked Heather if she would come over and just clean out Part, not, not the whole house, she was going to get other people, just clean out the office, 
that she had, maybe that she'd find some papers about the family she'd want to keep. And according to their, uh, Jason's testimony, the, her office had stuff that's been stacked up in there literally five or six years. I mean, there were magazines and, and bills and receipts and, you know, insurance policies and, and you know how that goes. And, they were, and they, they were stacked up. So she got in there and got a bunch of these big trash bags and just started going through them and tossing them. And she'd been in there for a handful of hours and she was going through a stack of kind of personal things that her grandmother had and there were, there were some envelopes in there. And she got about, to, according to her testimony, about halfway through the stack and she bumped into a letter that was addressed to her. And it was stale because the letter had been there for a long time. And it turned out it had been there, I, I forget if it was four years or five years. It had been sitting in the stack. And so she opened it up and it was a US savings bond for $2,000 made out to her. And it was unbelievable. And she ran home and she told Jason and Jason said, this is really good news. But I asked the Lord for $2,117.60. And I need, I need, I just, I need God to answer that prayer. Uh, and I'm grateful for this, but Heather understood. She said, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna cash it in at least. And he said, well, of course. And so she went and took the bond to the bank and it accrued interest. <laughs> and you wanna guess how much was deposited in their checking account? $2,117.60. And when he came to class that next mon Monday, he was wearing the pens because he was peeing all over himself. He was so excited. <laughs> so that was, if I may, an answer to prayer. You just put the intelligent agent principle on that. How likely was that? And was, it a, was there anything special about that happening besides the fact that it happened? Yeah, that was exactly what they'd been praying for. That's why the 2000 was meaningful, but it didn't do it for him because it wasn't specifically what he was asking. I'm not saying he wasn't grateful. Did you get the point on that? Now, I could go on and list all kinds of answers to prayer. Uh, but I don't want to do that now. I've, in the chap I've got two chapters in the book on prayer that uh, I have a lot of really great stories that are going to encourage you. By the way, there are 50 miracle stories in that book, and I'll stake my reputation on all of them. I've vetted them very, very carefully. And I'm, I made as certain as you can that these were real events that happened. I call people. I call publishers. I, I ask them tough questions. And uh, I, I will vouch for every single one of them that they're, they've been vetted uh, and are, are accurate. What I want to do is to clear up some confusions about petitionary prayer. By the way, in my view, the main purpose of prayer in the Bible is asking requests and receiving answers to requests. That is the number one prayer, uh, purpose for prayer. The Lord's Prayer is nothing but petitions. Now, worship and forgiveness and those things are absolutely central. And I hate to say one of them is any better, that none is better than the other. I'm just saying that uh, asking, laying your requests before God and, re and receiving answers from God is a very big deal in the Old and New Testaments. Now, um, let me just answer some questions. I had a brother, Brian, at the break tell me that I was helping answer some of his questions. Boy, that meant a lot to me. Um, and that, I'm hoping this is helping. It's just helping you in some way or other. So let, let's nail some questions down. Why is, there such, why is there this thing called prayer? What the heck is that about? Why did God set up the world so that there is such a thing as prayer? Well, the answer is actually pretty simple. How do people work together in a, in a unique way? They work together by talking to one another. That's how we get work done. And so in, our, my, in the philosophy department, we work together 
by talking to one another about the course assignments for the next year and who's going to teach what class, where are the departments going. People labor together in a unique way by talking. And prayer is simply a way that a, a, a human person and the divine persons co-labor together in a uniquely person-to-person -person way, by talking, by talking to each other. So prayer, the reason there's a prayer is because God is personal, we're personal, and talking to one another is the way persons work together. That's why there's such a thing as prayer. There's nothing particularly un, uh, uh, interesting about that. I mean, it just naturally falls out from the fact that God is not a thing. He's not a law of karma. He's not the force. He is personal. And I'm a person, I, I think. And so persons work together through talking. And that's what prayer is. All right. Now, a second question. Why should I pray for something if God already knows what I'm going to ask him? Well, this, this is confused, uh, this question is, because it assumes, because God already knows something, then it has to happen. And that's not true. If God already knows something, it will happen. It doesn't have to happen, but it will happen. And if it doesn't happen, then God would have foreknown that. So, for example, suppose that God foreknows that I'm going to go to McDonald's tomorrow for lunch. When tomorrow comes, am I free to go to McDonald's or not go to McDonald's? Yes, I have free will. And I am going to go to McDonald's, but I don't have to. Now, let's suppose tomorrow gets here and I decide to go to Jack and Carl's Jr., well, if I go to Carl's Jr., then God would have foreknown that I would go to Carl's Jr. So it isn't that God's foreknowledge determines what's going to happen. It's what happens is the ground for what God foreknows. And if we do X instead of Y, God will foreknow X. If we do Y, God foreknows Y. So the reason we pray is because our praying is actually the ground for God foreknowing that we're going to pray. It's not that he foreknows it, and therefore I have to pray. So, so let me give you an illustration of, of this that I think is, is just very, very cool. In, in, uh, uh, in, Helen Rosevere was born in 1925, and she lived to 2000. 16. She was from the UK and she was sent out as a single missionary woman and was and spent practically her whole life on the mission field in remote, and I mean remote areas of, of the jungles of Africa. She was so well known that she became a missionary states, statesman uh, for uh, the, the British Empire. And she was a famous woman. She was so godly. And she was sent to, uh, and spent a long time in the Congo. And she established, out in the middle of nowhere, a, a school for young girls to come and to learn reading, writing, and arithmetic and, and, and about Jesus and to win them to Jesus and build them in the faith. This, this place was so remote that they would, get, they would get a mail run there anywhere from every uh, two, mo two months to four months. There was no telling when it was going to happen, uh, but uh, that's about how regularly this place was. They had no electricity. They had a wood-burning stove, uh, and uh, the, the building had a concrete slab and, and, and so on. Now... One of the older girls in the school uh, had a baby. And I, I don't know if she was married or not, to be honest with you. But um, this, it was a part 
it was during the, the winter season when it was really cold, at, especially at night in, in that part of the Congo. It wasn't warm at all. And uh, they, they were in need of more blankets and more supplies, but they did have a wood, a, a, a wood burning stove. And they had a water bottle, thank God, to keep this little baby warm so it wouldn't freeze. And what happened was that this, they, were, they were heating some water to put it in the water bottle, and the water bottle burst. And by Helen's own testimony, uh, she was really afraid because she was afraid the baby would die uh, of cold. Because they couldn't, it would be hard to put the baby close to the stove because she didn't know the distance she could get hot on one side and cold on the other. And they didn't have a whole lot of extra linens or things like that to swaddle a little baby. And so one of the children said, well, let's pray that God will, that Jesus will give us a new water bottle. And like I said, Helen wrote this in a, in a book. And she said she didn't want to pray for that. Uh, and, but the, all the little girls said, yeah, yeah, let's pray for that. So held, okay, well, let's, So they held hands, and this little girl said, Jesus, we have a little baby, and you know that we need a water bottle, so she won't get cold at night. Would you send us a water bottle? And another little kid said, hey, while we're asking Jesus for a water bottle, let's ask him for a little teddy bear. The baby the baby would like a teddy bear. <laughs> And, and Helen's wanting to die, you know, under the bed or whatever. And so they prayed for a teddy bear and said, in, in Jesus' name, amen. And that, that was that. Well, they had not received uh, a parcel in the mail for four months. Okay, now, the, the, you know, listen, this is, this is all factual. That afternoon, a large box came to their place from a Sunday school class in Ohio. They opened up this box, and there were some linens and some pillowcases and some blankets, thank God. And there was a hot water bottle in that box. And one of the little kids said, Let's keep looking for the babe, for the teddy bear. And I'm not kidding, at the bottom of that box was a teddy bear. Now, they needed a hot, a hot water bottle. Who thinks to send a hot water bottle to somebody in the Congo? Because everybody thinks it's hot, and it's not. Parts of it are. It was really cold. But there was a hot water bottle in there and a teddy bear. And it came the day they prayed. Now, here's the point I want to make. God started answering that prayer four to five months before they prayed it because that class had to put that stuff in a box and send it by boat all the way, and then it had to get taken out to the bush, about a four-month trip. Now, God answered the prayer before Helen and the girls prayed it. But he answered the prayer because they prayed it. What that means is that God, in his foreknowledge, knew that they were going to pray for this at a certain date. And because he knew that, he began to set in motion the answer to that prayer so that by the time they asked it, the, the, the answer would come. Had they not prayed for that, I am convinced God would not have answered it. But he, so God answered it before they prayed, but he answered it because they prayed. It was because they prayed and God foresaw that, that he did what he needed to do to get the answer to the prayer in time for it to be answered after they prayed. So there is a case where what God foreknew was going to happen four months later caused him to act right then before the prayer was offered. But did he act 
Whether they prayed or not? No, he acted because they prayed. And had they not prayed, he wouldn't have acted, most likely. So God doesn't, we, we don't pray because God, uh, God knows what, what, what we're going to do because that's what we're going to do. It isn't that we have to do that because God foreknows it. It goes the other way. So our prayers actually make a difference as to what God foreknows, and it grounds his foreknowledge. All right. Now, there's something else that you need to know about this, and you may disagree with me on this, but I'll be willing to bet you've never thought about it. So it would be a good idea to at least be willing to think about this. Are you ready to put your thinking caps on? This is going to be a little tough. How many of you are willing to do that? Okay. Okay, very good. Things in the world have attributes. That means they have characteristics or properties. An apple has the attribute of being red. It has the property of being round. It has the attribute of being sweet. And so on. So things have attributes. Now, some of, some of the thing's attributes are fully, are fully actualized. Others are, are what are called dispositional attributes. And that means that they are abilities to do something if, if that is triggered. Okay, so a stick of dynamite has the attribute of being cylindrical in shape. You, you understand that? It's a little thin cylindrical thing. And that is an attribute that is fully actualized in that stick of dynamite. It has the attribute of having a disposition to explode. That's a real disposition, but it hasn't been actualized yet. If something triggers that disposition, then it becomes actualized and it explodes. Now, if you tried to get a rock to explode by heating a fuse, lighting a fuse and it ran into the rock, the rock's just going to sit there because the rock doesn't have the disposition to explode if something happens to it. The dynamite does. Are you there? Right now, I am exercising the attribute of speaking English. I do not, I used to have the dispositional attribute to read German, but I haven't used it and I lost it. But I do have the dispositional attribute to regain the dispositional attribute to speak German. When you're asleep, you have the, the power to speak English, even if you're not. Does that make sense? So some of our attributes are fully actualized. Others we have, but they're in potentiality. They need, to be, they, they need to be actualized. Are you there? Okay. Now, some of God's attributes are, act, are fully actualized, and others are dispositional. Now, let me give you an actualized attribute of God. God has the actualized attribute of being infinite, of, of being as completely perfect as, as, poss as anything could possibly be perfect. That is an attribute that God has like an apple has the color red. What about dispositional attributes? Does God have any of those? Yeah. His omnipotence. God's omnipotence means that he has the ability or the dispositional power to do anything power can do, even if he's not doing it. Do you understand right now there's a lot of God's power that he's not exercising? He could be creating myriads of planets and galaxies and all kinds of things, and it could be creating 50 million new people every day. But, but even though there are a lot of things that God has the power to do, he's not doing it. So his power is dispositional. His, his omni, omnipotence is dispositional. That means that he, he has all power, but he's not exercising all power all the time. Are you there? 
What about his knowledge? See, I think God's knowledge is dispositional. Now, let me explain what I mean by that. To say that God is omniscient means the following. For every truth, God knows that truth. So for any truth, God knows it. And for any falsehood, God refuses to believe it. So God believes and knows any and all truths. He's, um, there's not a single truth he doesn't know. So that's what it means to say God's omniscient. But does he have to be aware of everything he knows all the time? I don't think so. For example, God knows how many ounces of snot are in all the sheep in the Rocky Mountains. There's a number, and that would be the number of how much snot is in all the sheep's noses in the mountains of Colorado. Does God have to think about that all the time? I don't, I, does he know it? Yeah. What does that mean? That means anytime he wants to, he can remind himself, he can become aware of what he already knows. Right? You got to nod because I don't know if you're getting this. Nod or nod off or something. Okay. So what that means is that there are a lot of things God knows that he's not, that he, he's not aware of. And if he wants to, he can become aware of anything he knows anytime he wants to without anybody helping him. Okay. But sometimes he lets people help him, as the following will illustrate. One day my daughter Allison came home from fifth grade, and she said, Dad, you are not going to believe this, but there are three branches of government, and I know what they do. Well, I know that, and I know the fundamental thing they're supposed to do. Uh, but... Guess what? I didn't go there. Could I have reminded myself of what I knew? Because what I knew was dispositional. That meant I had the ability to, to grasp the truth of how many branches of government they were, but I wasn't thinking about that then, so I had the ability to do that, but I wasn't aware of it. I just wasn't paying attention to how many branches of government there were. Could I have become aware of that by myself? Yeah. But I decided not to because I wanted her to make me aware of what I already knew so she would get the thrill of, of, of experiencing me becoming aware of it again. So I let her remind me of what I already knew. I wasn't aware of it until she reminded me. But if she did, I knew it anyway, because if I could have reminded myself of it without letting her do it, because it, I knew the truth of the matter, but I just wasn't thinking about it right then. I think in prayer there are times when God already knows what we're going to pray about, but he doesn't choose to become aware of it, and he lets us bring it back to his awareness, but it's not like we're teaching him something. He already knows the propositional truth of what we're going to ask for. It's just that if he wants to, he can do like sin. He, he, he doesn't, he, he, he box the east as far as the way. He doesn't remember your sins. What if that's literally true? That means that God knows your sins in that anytime he wants to, he can remind himself of them. But what if he chooses not to be aware of them? He still knows them. And I think prayer is the same way. I think sometimes God allows us to remind him of something that if he wanted to, he could just consult his own mind and he would know what we we're going to ask. But sometimes he lets us remind him because it gives us the, a thrill, the thrill of bringing this to God's attention, something that he already knew. So, so the reason that we pray even though God already foreknows things is that A... The reason he foreknows it is because we're going to pray it, not the other way around. And B, sometimes he allows us the privilege of bringing to his attention what he already knows to give us a chance to be a part uh, uh, of the team. Now, uh, here, are you, are you out there okay? Okay. I mean, do you agree with me? 
Uh, but you're hanging in there. Okay. Now, um, two more things, and then we'll have a Q&A time, and then we'll, then we'll go home. Why wouldn't a perfect God just do the, do the right thing, whether we ask him or not? Why wouldn't a perfect God try to do as much good as, as is within his power, whether we pray for it or not? I mean, he knows what's the best thing for your future. Why wouldn't he just grant that, whether you ask him for something or not? And why wouldn't he thwart the, the greatest amount of harm and evil that would happen to us, whether we prayed about it or not? So it would seem like prayer is irrelevant. Or you can do what some people do in punt, to what the Bible doesn't teach, and that is, well, what will you pray? We're just trying to align ourselves with God's will. Well, that may happen sometimes, but a lot of times is we're trying to persuade the Lord to do something. I mean, the, the, the word for prayer in the Old Testament is reeb. That's the Hebrew word for bringing a court case to a judge to persuade him to do something. And we are, in the Old Testament, they, God invited people to come and bring their persuasive case to God that he might answer the prayer. And that's what happened with Sodom and Gomorrah. God listened and was persuaded to answer a prayer. And Martin Luther said, you better, when you bring your prayer to God, you bring a persuasive prayer. And you give God reasons for why he should answer this, and it's in his best interest. All right. Well, the reason that God doesn't, isn't going to do good things for you if you don't ask him, and why he won't thwart bad things unless you ask him, though he will sometimes, is because God has a bigger purpose in life than, by the end of time, achieving the greatest amount of good possible and thwarting the greatest amount of evil possible. That's not his purpose. If it were, then it wouldn't matter what we did. God would simply achieve the, obtaining the greatest amount of good possible before the second coming and thwarting the greatest amount of evil. But if you look at Scripture, that's not the purpose God created the world. From the, from the Old Testament to the New Testament, the purpose of God in creating the world was to glorify himself by forming a kingdom of people who join that kingdom voluntarily and freely and who exhibit the relationships towards one another that happen among the Trinity, so they learn to treat each other like Father, Son, and Spirit treat each themselves, and they co-labor with God to spread his kingdom and his teachings to the world, and that's the purpose of history, so that the purpose is for him to form a community of free agents who co-labor with him by entering his kingdom and by working together with God to accomplish good in the world and the spread of the gospel and so on. Now what that means is that sometimes God will not do a good thing for us because we don't ask him, because he's more interested in getting us to learn how to ask and depend than to granting that good thing. He's more about getting us to be, a, to, to be drawing near him and working with him in his kingdom. There are times when he will let a harmful thing happen to us because we didn't pray for this not to happen, because God's purpose is not just to let us get through here with the least amount of harmful things happening to us. His bigger purpose, he doesn't want harmful things to happen to us, but he's got a bigger fish to fry. And that is to produce in us a certain kind of person. A person who is suitable to live in the kingdom, who's learned to be dependent on God and to work with him to accomplish God's purposes. Now, in order for that to happen, he's got to let us have a say in what takes place in human history or else it's a puppet show. Now, that's my view of free will, and you may disagree. But assuming I'm right for the sake of argument, then that means that what we do or don't do is going to matter. 
And that means that what we pray for and don't pray for is going to make a difference in the net amount of good and evil that happens in world history by the end of the age. So that our prayers and our laboring with God is more important to him than just going ahead and thwarting evil and doing good, irrespective of whether we cooperate or pray or do anything else. Now, sometimes he does that, but there are other times he doesn't. That's why praying is important. And I'll give you an illustration. You remember in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, uh, 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 I think it's verse, uh, let me see if I can read that. 2 Corinthians 1, 11. Paul, Paul said that, that he's going through a hard time. And he says, but God, is, God will rescue us through the prayers of many so that the many who prayed will be blessed when the answer comes. Now, what does that mean? I used to think, why, why in the world would I want to get a lot of people praying for something. I mean, if I'm praying for it, God, God hears it. Is he deaf? I mean, he, I, he needs 100 people praying for it. What's that? I don't believe that. I, I asked God for it, and he knows the need now, and I've told him, and, and he's going to do what, he, you know, what he's going to do. That's it. Why do I need to get a bunch of people praying for it? Well, I was an idiot, as I typically am, because I forgot that God's other purpose in answering prayer is to bless as many people as possible with the answer. The way to do that is to get more people praying for it. That way, the more people that are praying for something, when the answer comes, all the people that were praying for it are blessed by the answer to prayer. If I just do it myself and it gets answered, I get blessed, but nobody else does. So, so that's one of the things, that's why we get more people to pray and so on and so forth. Now, we've got about 15 minutes, and we're going to have a little Q&A. Uh, I was attempting to clear up just some uh, questions you may have about prayer, and uh, there are a lot of exciting examples that you can read about uh, that will really bless you, I assure you, but I just don't want to spend the time going over those now because I know some of you have comments and questions. So... Uh, if you if you want to ask a question, oh my gosh, there are people out there. <laughs> uh, feel free to uh, come up to the microphone and introduce yourself. Uh, there are microphones in two places, and uh, is there someone there? Just, and by the way, if you don't think you've got a good question or know how, don't think it's well formulated, that's okay. Just say. We'll work on it together. I, we're all friends in here, and so if you got a question that you're thinking, I don't know if I got it uh, really well formulated. We'll get up there and we'll formulate it together. No, no, pro no, no, nobody but us chickens. Yeah, yes. Go to the microphone there. Are you going to ask a question? Well, right. how, how do we know it's a miracle or we just take God for granted or think it's a coincidence? Uh, do, say it again. How, how, I'm sorry. Say it again. So, sometimes I have wonderful things happen to me and I don't realize to hours or weeks or months later that it was a miracle. So how do we determine immediately it was a miracle? Well, I gave, you, I gave you a way to know. And it's that principle that had, if it's improbable and if there is something special about the event, then those two put together mean it wasn't a coincidence, it was a miracle. If it's just improbable, but there's no, there's, there's no particular thing that's special about it, then it's probably just a, a, a random event. Um, I would say that sometimes we don't know what was special about it until months later. So while it was a miracle, we, did, we weren't able to recognize that it was one until we, it dawned on us later on, having more information, oh my goodness, I see why that happened now. That was unbelievably special. 
Well, it was already a miracle, but we couldn't recognize it because we didn't know why it was special. Now, I'm not saying God can't do things that are, are regular, I mean, that aren't improbable. I mean, if there's a 70% chance of rain and you pray, it may be that God caused the rain to come. The problem is, if it's, if it's likely, we don't know if it was a miracle because we don't know if it, because it would have been likely to have happened whether you prayed or not. That's the problem. And I'm distinguishing a miracle from something God does through just normal providential affairs in the world. All right, is there somebody else over here? Or? Yes, sir. Hi, I'm Charlie. Hi, Charlie, good to see you. Oh, yes. Um, I'm curious, so as Christians, I know we all believe that God can make miracles happen. Yes. Um, but the secular people don't really believe it, and I would sometimes wonder personally, like, if, like, if we believe we have so much proof that there are miracles, but I don't like the a, word proof. Maybe not proof. Can, 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 <laughs> yeah, I want to let you finish your question, but there's a, yeah. this is a teaching moment. Mm -hmm. People say, <laughs> can you prove God exists? And I ask them, what in the world do you mean by proof? I have no idea what it means. I know what it means in two fields, logic and mathematics. And a proof is where you start with premises and you're able to generate a conclusion according to the rules of that logical system without ending up in a contradiction. That's a proof. I don't know what a proof is in history. Can I prove George Washington exists? I don't have any idea what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. What we're looking for, can you show beyond reasonable doubt? Proof, get, let's not use that word because atheists use it because it sounds like it's a 20 foot high hurdle or 30 foot you gotta jump over. And I think it's unfair. So I'd rather just use, we've got strong evidence, or we think we have evidence that places this beyond reasonable doubt. I'd rather use that. Now, please, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. No, I, I, totally, to... I totally understand. <laughs> yeah. Good. Good. And I'm just always wondering, is like, why, how, why do we feel like we have such... Strong evidence. Strong evidence for, for such a thing, but there's such a large group of people that doesn't and doesn't yeah. believe that it's the same thing. And I always wonder, are we missing something? Well, yeah, we're not talking to them and giving them reasons to believe. We're afraid, we're cowards, because we don't know why we believe. Uh, this was a study was done by the Pew Research Foundation and they discovered that uh, the millennials were leaving not only the church, but Christianity, and they found the six top reasons through in a massive research study that people were abandoning the faith were apologetic reasons. It wasn't that the preaching wasn't interesting. It wasn't that people didn't love them. It wasn't that the worship wasn't good. It was nobody answered their questions. And when you asked a question, people would roll their eyes and just say, well, that, you're just trying to be a troublemaker. You've got to have faith. And so one of the reasons, and I could trace this back to what happened in the 1920s. And I know the whole history of this, because from the 1920s to the 60s, the church lost its ability to defend its faith. And so the 60s hit, and from that point on, we have postmodern relativism, and we have scientific naturalism that the physical world is all there is because the church does not know how to answer the question why we believe such and such. And so unbelievers think that, that, that becoming a Christian is just an emotional thing if you have a need. It's just a blind step in the dark. And they'd rather have sex than do that. It's, this is all largely about just promiscuous sex. And so they'd rather do that. Uh, if, they, if you're not giving them any reason to believe this is true, then they want to follow their, their desires and their bodily passions. Uh, so that's the, number, that's the number one reason. Look, this, that, this evidence is available in any library. 
And it, we've never had better evidence in my lifetime. It's unbelievable the strength of the case for Christianity. Nobody knows it. We don't, we don't have courses on this. We don't teach people how, a simple way to answer the question, how do you know there's a God? And why do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? And there are, there are simple answers you can learn that will satisfy 90% of the people you meet. For the other 10%, you need somebody like me who's given his life to this and who's a scholar in this area to come in and tee it up with somebody on the other side. But that's the problem. And in the secular culture, the problem is that once people lost the confidence that we could know truth outside science, that is, we can know truth about life after death, we can know truth about what's right and wrong, uh, and, and, and once they lost confidence that, that we could actually know truth in those extra scientific areas, truth became irrelevant because you can't find it anyway, and in its place was the satisfaction of desire as the goal for life. And that's where instant gratification, 15 minutes of fame, you name it, has rushed in to fill that vacuum because truth is, is no longer relevant. This is being taught in the universities, in the humanities departments. So I think those are the couple of reasons. People, uh, even, and I, 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 that Jewish woman was a, did not believe, she became a believer because of a miracle. And my, Beverly, my sister-in-law is married to a Jewish man who's not a believer, they live in Florida. She went to Neiman Marcus, I call it Neiman Markup, but <laughs> she went there and she bought something and she went to check out and she saw this guy at the checkout counter and she just sensed he was Jewish. She could tell, and, and up behind his checking out register was a picture of Jesus. And she said, sir, if you don't mind, I'm married to a Jewish man. I'm wondering, are you Jewish? She said, yes, I am. I, I, I'm, born, I'm a natural born Jew. And she said, well, but you've got a picture of Jesus back up there. I don't understand. And he said, well, I was Jewish. Uh, I was a, kind of just a regular Jew until five years ago, and I had cardiac arrest, and I had to rush me to the emergency room, and I died for about 30 minutes. And I left my body, and I could see everything they were doing, and I went through this tunnel, and I showed up in heaven. And I met Jesus up there, and I was not expecting that. And Jesus said, it's time for you to stop running away from me. I want you to go back, and I want you to follow me and believe in me, and I want you to tell everybody that you know that I am the Son of God and the Jewish Messiah. And he was sent back, and he's been going to Messianic, congregation ever since. That was a miracle that, so sometimes miracles persuade people to become Christians. There's no doubt about that, especially in the Muslim world. Oh, golly. But in this country, we're so secularized. Even Christians are secular. They think science is true and miracles aren't, that we just don't know how to defend our faith. It breaks my heart. But we can do better, and I, I, we, we've got to. Okay, how about one more? One or two more. Yes. Hi, my name's Tony. Hi, Tony. Good Hi. to see you. Um, I guess I'll ask two questions, but they're similar. So you gave the example of the woman who was cured of her cancer. It, she was healed. It was yes. completely gone. If that cancer would have come back, yes. does that erase the fact that it was a yeah. miracle? No. It doesn't. No, because okay. it, does, it satisfies the design filter, and it was obviously a, a divine act, clearly. Now, you've got to remember that we're all going to die, so our, when we get healed, it, it, this is all going to be undone at some point. And sometimes God heals, and it, and it lasts for a season, and then it, it comes back. And there's a reason why God heals for a season, but it's not meant to be a permanent healing. Uh, so uh, that... That happens, the, we, the way we know it happens is that the original healing clearly satisfied the, the, this intelligent agent principle. It could not have been a coincidence. 
or else we're going to have to, you know, change the jury system. Because if they use this principle in, in you know, if a, if a guy's wife drives off a cliff and the weather wasn't bad and so on, and it's highly improbable that this would happen, he's not going to be found guilty because improbable things happen all the time. But if they found out that he had taken out a million dollar insurance policy on her, and two weeks before she drove off the cliff, he had brought two, two tickets to Hawaii with his secretary uh, for later, now the guy's going to be put in the slammer because it was improbable and there's something about her death that's special now. He gets the insurance money, he gets to be with his secretary, watch Dateline. <laughs> With the, when those are put together, bingo, you know it was done on purpose. So I say the original, in her situation, that fits the design filter, even if it doesn't last. Okay. And I don't, I, I have 14 reasons that I've done my best to offer my brothers and sisters some ways to think about why things don't get answered and sometimes why they don't continue, but sometimes it's just a mystery. So that would, be, that would be my answer. Okay. I could be wrong about that, but that's the best I got. Well, then similarly, yes. uh, you talked about um, specific prayers being answered. Yes, sir. And I've done that, and prayers were answered specifically. Uh, but there were two in particular where what I prayed for specifically happened, but then they reversed after some time. So, again, similarly to the miracle question. Can I, did, did your prayer involve other people? Yes. Did, did it involve their, their free will? Yes. Okay. Now, you, you're, if, if you're strongly Calvinistic, you, you're not going to like this answer. <laughs> now, I Thank am, you. yeah. I, I do not believe that you can lose your salvation. Uh, I don't believe anybody could be saved without God uh, giving them common grace. But then I believe people have free, common sense freedom where they can say yes or no to the gospel and it's up to them. So I don't believe that predestination is unconditional. I believe it's in accordance with God's love, which is not coercive. And he will choose those that he knows would respond if he chose them. So it is in accordance with his free will, but it's based on him being loving. It's not based on our choice, but it's consistent with our free choices. So that's where I'm at on this. And it's okay if we differ. I, I, I mean, it's okay whether I say it's okay. But I, but I, but I want you to know I'm not here to push, push an agenda. I'm just trying to say that I, I will never pray for somebody to get saved. Because God is not capable of doing that. It is not within God's omnipotence to cause a free agent to do something and they still be free. That's a contradiction. And so the reason I won't pray for somebody to be saved is that God desires everybody to be saved. And yet people aren't but he desires them to be. And the reason they're not is they won't. They say, no, they did what the Pharisees did. When the, Luke tells us they resisted the boule of God, and the, there are two words in Greek for, for will, boule and uh, fellow, I think it is, and boule is the strongest word for will. The Pharisees resisted the very will of God, and people do that too and will not go to heaven. So what I do is I pray that, God, would you <clears throat> shine a light on my <clears throat> son-in-law's resume? Will you give him strength in that interview? Will you just speak to that boss good things about my son-in-law? <laughs> and would you bring, in terms of saving people, I, will you bring people across their path that are godly Christians that will influence them? Will you cause something to happen to them where they realize their need and get rid of their pride? But I'll stop short 
of praying that they'll get a, a job because, that, because I think that that God has condescended to where he has chosen, he didn't have to do this, but to give us free will and he's not going to violate that. He could have done it differently, but he didn't in my view. If that's the case, then it's up to the bosses who, he, who gets hired. Okay? <clears throat> so the reason that sometimes a prayer gets answered, like if you're praying for somebody to, to turn around and go a different direction, and they do, that could very well be that God prompted and did things short of coercing, and they listened. But after a while, they began to harden their heart, and they stopped listening, and they, they decided to turn away. And that was God answering the prayer, but given free will, and this involved free will, what they end up doing with their lives is up to them. And they have nobody to blame. I don't mean to be mean-spirited here, but themselves, not God's choices. Okay, that's, that's how I would answer that, given my theology, and those with a different theology may answer it differently, and that's fine. How about one more? I'm, is that okay? I'm, I'm getting a little tired. Hi, I'm Jack. You? Um, I guess my question, like you mentioned, like Christian or churches nowadays, they, you know, they believe in science more than miracles. Obviously, through, you know, through the sharing of like your sharing, like miracles still exist. Like, it, like, w what is the big picture? Like, of course, I know like things that through your sharing of miracles, like it's going to strengthen our faith. But it's God. Like, what is God trying to show us? What was the big picture? Just trying to. What am I trying to show you? Yeah. Yeah, I'm trying to say that that. Okay. You do not have direct control over your faith, over what you believe. If, just to prove this, I will, I will quite literally pay anybody $500 if you will believe one of the following. That there is a literal pink elephant flying above my head. That 2 plus 2 is equal to the square root of minus 1. That there never was a being called George Washington. And the Atlantic Ocean is filled with ping pong balls. I'll give you $500 if you'll believe that. And not a one of you can believe it. Even though you have motive, because you're not, you don't have the power to choose to believe something you don't believe. Now, what you do have is the indirect ability to believe something. So if you want to change what you believe, you can't will yourself to, to just change or else you'll be, fake, you'll be a fake. You'll talk like you believe it, but you really don't. If you want to change what you believe, the first place that you have freedom is where you put your mind. And what you can do is to start looking into things, start reading things that beef up this point of view and reasons for the other point of view not making sense. Talk to people. Be become a detective, an evidence gatherer. And in the book, I list how you can start believing in these things more strongly. And I've got uh, uh, six or seven specific things you can do. For example, subscribe to the Jesus Film Newsletter and read that thing every time it comes out. And you're going to see the Book of Acts is happening all over the world. And my, my good friend, uh, Pastor Steve, he ha this, this guy has all kinds of stuff that he knows about how to build your faith in miracles. But the first thing I want to do is to strengthen your faith that all of what we believe is really true and that it's something worth giving your life to. And... Uh, by, by gaining more and more evidence for this, it just it makes it hard not to believe. Uh, the other thing is that I would like to encourage you to take some risks and to begin to step out and not be presumptuous, but to see, to see someone healed. I'll, I'm going to talk about how, a little bit about how to do that tomorrow. And um, I have a whole thing in the book on it, but the reason I wrote the book was not only to strengthen people's confidence that, that, that th these things are happening today, but give them a little bit of more hope to step out and try. Try and be willing to fail and learn from, from your quote-unquote failures. Pray specifically, and if nothing happens, then try to figure out what happened. And, and so it's to grow us in the Lord and to give us confidence that our faith is really true. That's, that's my purpose. 
Tomorrow we're going to talk about how God speaks to us in five different ways. There's some great, really great stories. And I'm going to give you, I think, something that's going to relieve you about, you know, how do I know it's God and how I know it's me. I think this will help you. We're going to talk about uh, 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 healing and, and, and a little bit about how, how to pray for the sick. And then we'll talk about um, angels and a little bit about specifically about demons and the Christian. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. Okay, thank you. And uh, God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>